Okay, so this is the pre class recording for the class on Tuesday, July 5th. And we're going to cover two days worth um, or a day and a half. I had originally planned to teach Plato's Crito on last Friday, but I forgot we ran out of time. But I did want to comment a bit on the posts that I had handed in. And um, this, is, this is what I think truly. Um, I know that the world in a lot of ways is falling apart and there's lots of shootings and there's disagreements about what to do about the shootings because it's politically polarizing. And there's um, race issues and uh, climate issues are the most important issues. And I mean, there's a lot of stuff. So I know that the world that you're going to go out into is going to be difficult. But I also know that every semester I get students whose parents have somehow protected them or encouraged them enough so that here they are. They're ready to be educated. They have natural ability, they have motivation. And they, as far as I can tell, they don't have any particular, um, they aren't yet polarized. So college is that time when you can leave home and open up your mind and think about life from a broader perspective. And that's when I, the students talk in class, it just seems like they just want, you know, they have goals in life. They, as long as somebody's opinions don't hurt me, I'm not gonna judge them. And that's great. Um, the problem is that a society has been structured in a way that you might not need to have any bad opinions, but um, the resources that are accessible to you or whatever, based on past decisions and opinions affect you. But I don't want you to be afraid. I want you to be courageous. Um, but uh, one student referred to the class as a safe space. And that is what I want this class to be, is a safe space. It might be the only time in your life where you actually can discuss serious questions listen to other people, have an open mind, know that once you leave the class, you're, you're in a rut, you tend to be in a rut, you tend to find friend groups, and they tend to be more polarized. So I appreciate the fact that we're all together coming from different points of view and listening to each other and respecting each other. Because I think it's the only way you'll be able to move forward and you'll be able to take a, lead, a leadership role in 20 years. And I've, I've watched, you know, things get more and more polarized and it really grieves me because it hurts my students, it hurts my children. Um, but, you know, when people were discussing Socrates, I hope you at least understand that there are people like Socrates who do get criticized, but there are people who think they're like Socrates who are not, and they are causing problems. And they think it's because 
prejudice people, demonize them. And it's not. It's because they aren't really open-minded and sincere. And that's a corruption of the tradition, I think, of reading Plato. And I know plenty of scholars that really disagree about what's going on and how to use the texts to cultivate an open mind. But anyway, so you were clocking in on whether Socrates was guilty of corrupting the youth and of not believing in the city's gods. And he was declared guilty and he was given capital punishment. So he was blamed. It's his fault that Athens fell. And um, now he's in prison and he's going to die. So this dialogue takes place the night before uh, he knows he's going to die because there was a ritual when these ships went out. You couldn't have any killings when the ships were out. Now they're back. So his friend Crito comes to, tr to assume crito has got it all set up. He's going to help Socrates escape. No questions asked. And then he comes, he's got it all set up. He's bribed the guard at the prison. He can get Socrates down to the port, the Piraeus. He can get him over to Thessaly. He has friends in Thessaly, fine. So Crito gives him all these reasons for why he should go. Um, first of all, Um, I would lose a friend, right? Okay, now you have to think about this. What would you do if you were unjustly accused? Um, and you had a chance to escape, all right? Is it a good reason I would lose a friend? Well, everybody has a friend. And if everybody's friends felt like their job is to protect their friends, we would not have any legal system at all. There is a respect in which you have to abide by the laws, even if it's somebody you care about, your friend or your family. That was the issue with Euthyphro. And in that case, you know, Maybe you could argue that he should have let somebody else take his dad to prison or to court or something like that. But anyway, it's tricky. That's the main thing. It's tricky how you make these decisions. Um, have you ever broken a law to protect your friend? And the honor code would be one of those that you're supposed to report if you think someone has cheated or social code also. And that just seems like ratting on your friend. But on the other hand, if people don't, basically the honor system is sort of a joke. So it, it's tricky. All right, the reason number two, people would not believe you refused to escape. They would think I was too cheap to get you out. All right. So is this true in our country? And should it be true that wealthy people can always get off? And the way they do that is they pay really expensive lawyers. And the reason the lawyers are really expensive is because they succeed at getting people off for whom the crime is pretty obvious. So... What do you think of this fact that if you're rich, you can get off because you can hire a lawyer. If you're poor, no way. Uh, the state is obliged to give you a lawyer who works for legal aid or works for the state. But lots of those lawyers are not any good. And in Texas, for example, if you have a death penalty, you can get a lawyer. Well, one of those lawyers was debarred and one of them fell asleep during the 
trial and they, they really didn't give it much effort. And it was nothing like if you were rich. Now, the next issue is that people might think the rich shouldn't get an advantage, but what, what about, here's an example. At years ago, one of the members of the Kennedy family was accused of rape. And um, what should the family do, right? Should the family just say, well, you take care of your own problems, you know, you're responsible, you get yourself a lawyer, whatever you want to do, but we're, we're not going to help you out. <laughs> well, that's not what the family did, you know, they hired the most expensive lawyer and he got off. Now, do the rest of us think, well, of course, that's natural. Or do you think this system really isn't a democracy? It's really run by the rich because the rich can do whatever they want. Um, but so what does that tell you about respect for the laws of Athens at the time and also for the laws of the US? So Crito thinks he's trying to save his friend, but he doesn't think his lack of respect for the laws led to the very instability that caused Meletus to bring Socrates to court and the jurors to vote against him. Okay, I hope you understand this, that when citizens routinely break the law, ignore the law, have enough money to get out of any kind of legal accountability, um, and the society starts to tank, then you got to find someone to blame. And liberal arts institutions and liberal arts professors, some people are blaming them. So they're, they are one outlet to blame um, because they don't teach, you know, uh, fundamental Christianity, like in this class, for example. It's not traditional. Christianity. Um, and the irony of this dialogue is that Socrates is the only one in Athens that actually respects the rule of law. He doesn't respect the decision that the jurors made, but he does respect the fact that Athens had a system. He had a trial by jury. He could have gotten a lawyer, like Crito would have paid for a lawyer, but he didn't want it. He defended himself because he defended his way of life. And his way of life is making people accountable for their beliefs, including their religious beliefs. And so because he wanted people to be accountable for their religious beliefs, just like I do in this class, um, he got accused of not believing in the city's gods because you're supposed to be, if you can find a Bible quote to support what you do, then that's okay because you believe in the city's gods like Euthyphro. So Euthyphro, Melitus would think Euthyphro was fine because he used the quote to justify what he did. Socrates thought that story where uh, the father, uh, the son cuts off the genitals of the father is a metaphor for a psychological thing. It wasn't supposed to be literal and it wouldn't justify all sorts of children taking their parents to court for all sorts of shady, sketchy reasons, not just legitimate reasons. But anyway, so Socrates does respect the rule of law and he accepts the punishment, even though he thinks the Athenians corrupted their system. It wasn't the system that was the problem. It was the corruption of the minds and hearts of the jurors who voted and who were manipulated 
long before the jury trial happens. Um, his third reason. So in both cases, Euthyphro thinks he's trying to get Athens this, uh, back to normalcy by taking his court, father to court for murder. And Socrates says, unless you were sure, I think this might just undermine social stability. It might have the opposite effect. And Crito thinks he's trying to save his friend because eventually the Athenians will figure this out. But actually, he's part of the problem because of his lack of respect for the laws destabilized Athens, and then they look for someone to blame. Reason number three, if you're worried your friends might get into trouble, we're being courageous. We're taking the risk. Is this real courage to help your friends escape the laws? Number four, there are other places you can go and live where people will accept you. This is not true. So I think you should think about what if somebody unjustly accused you, you have friends that can help you escape, you have a place you can go. What place is that? <laughs> Some very, very remote place. If you go with your family, if you have a family, then it can be Papua New Guinea. I mean, it has to be some very remote place where nobody will know you're there and you live out your life there and your children live there in a very primitive, you know, situation. Whereas if Socrates accepts the punishment, his children can live in Athens. He's very concerned that they get the right education that they love justice and wisdom more than money and power. And he's sad that he can't be there to raise him and he trusts Crito to teach him, but he'd much rather have his children living in Athens than to have to take them to some extremely remote place. That's still true. If you were to escape now, you couldn't go to Europe You'd have to go to some, you know, remote place in Africa or, you know, some island somewhere. <laughs> Is that what you want for your children? Um, you're playing into the hands of your enemies. Well, this is always true. And this is really a part of polarization that drives me crazy. No matter what one party does, the other party says, you see, they're rotten. <laughs> Um, and they refuse to admit they're wrong. It's just really horrible. And I feel for you, because if you want to try to figure stuff out, that's why I read, oh, I don't know, 50 books about the bigger picture behind what's going on, so that I just don't... <laughs> check out with the latest news because it's too emotion driven and it's too polarized. It's really unhealthy. Um, did you get defensive about something you did that might be questionable and someone you don't like believes it is uh, because you just don't want to admit someone you don't like is right. And that's hard to catch yourself. Number six is you're betraying your children. And this is the one that was hard for Socrates, right? But is it true that as soon as you have children, you should never do anything to criticize the social order because you don't want your children to be humiliated, jailed, you know, or do you, you don't want to be. They might be humiliated or punished if you get jailed or killed, you can't raise them. So you just put up and shut up, right? On the other hand, if you don't say anything and your society gets worse and worse, then when your children grow up and they go, why didn't you say something? Why are you handing this to me? This is too difficult. So it's difficult. Um, I know when I had kids, 
I, every day you make a judgment call about how much should I call this out and how much should I just accept it and go along with it. Um, would you be critical of your parents or proud of them for standing up for what they believe, even if it involves some risk? What does it mean to be a responsible parent? That's a very difficult question. Okay, response number one. A good person doesn't worry about what they think. Okay, if there's some they in your head, <laughs> you know, you got to get it out of there. Like, the government, ah, oh, you know, or the rich, or the the, or the, the. please get this out of your head. Uh, you just ask, what's the right thing to do? It doesn't, and you don't worry about what other people think. This is hard, you know, because when you're a teenager, that's exactly what you do. You go from believing blindly whatever your parents say to all of a sudden, well, what would my friends say, you know? What do I think? Okay, so you have to rip yourself up. That's really, really hard. Um, and it's a process. And I mean, you never really get over it. You never get to the point where you always have it right. So I, you need to know that. Um, the second one, a good person does not allow reason to be corrupted by outside pressure. Not mere life, but the good life is the life worth living. A good person never does wrong intentionally. They might think they're acting well and decide later that the action was not the best one. But a good person will never act against what they believe is wrong at the time they're making the choice. A good person does not injure anyone. This includes retaliating or injuring someone else as a response to be injured by them, right? A good person recognizes the following. Human beings need a system of law and order. I think you really need to think about this because Americans are indoctrinated into thinking, believing in rugged individualism. I pulled myself up by the bootstraps. So everybody else ought to be able to. This is not true. <laughs> this is really not true. The housing market is incredibly biased by race and gender and ethnicity. Um, and the housing market, it affects educational opportunities. And there are plenty of exceptions. There are full philanthropy, philanthropic organizations, and then some tax uh, programs through the government. But the system itself is really um, corrupt, but it's better than no system at all. The more developed we are, the more we need social institutions and laws. So um, we really need to be educated about our dependence and our interdependence because it's very acute. <laughs> um, I could, well, okay, let me give an example. I walk across a bridge on the Mississippi River every day and I can see downtown Minneapolis. And you can say, oh, that's capitalism built all that wealth. But also, you're standing on a bridge. The bridge was built by tax money. You were, um, it's part of a, there's a park along the edge of the river. That's caught, the government designated that that would be a park rather than having a factory built there. There's clean air. Well, that's because of government regulations. And now those regulations are being weakened. There's clean water in the river, and that's because of government regulations. If you walk across the bridge, there's the Longfellow Grill where you can go eat. Well, the building is not going to fall on your head because of government regulations. The food is not going to be rotten because of government regulations. Um, 
the prices you have to pay your wait staff a certain minimum because of government regulations. Um, it's you really have to envision what the world would be without any laws. It would be pretty awful. But on the other hand, there's arguments for too many regulations, or they're poorly written, or the people in charge only um, punish, they don't apply the laws to their friends, and they only apply it to, to outsiders. I mean, there's so many ways the system is corrupt. So that's why you have to be very careful when you hear one story, one point about this, uh, this is corrupt or that's a, because it's all interconnected. And that's why I think at the end of the day, you just focus on, well, what do I think I can do best? And I have to follow my reason in making each decision. And I have to learn from my mistakes. I have to gain evidence. I have to unite my idea of the good life with reason. And, and then, you know, proceed. But um, in a democratic society, people are free. But if you decide to stay, you have to abide by the laws. When someone is accused of breaking the laws, they have a chance to have a, a jury trial or a trial before a judge. But they have to abide by the decision. And yes, there is corruption in the judiciary. And yes, the system is biased. Um, and the more you read about it, the more you realize it is. But I think the best solution is um, to have philanthropy set up philanthropic organizations that try to correct from some of the problems in the legal system or uh, vote for candidates, insist that your candidates have concerns about corruptions in the legal system, whatever. So just blowing up the whole thing or just ignoring the laws is not the solution. Okay, so what is Socrates' response? It, when Crito says, I would lose a friend, Socrates just said, you'll always remember me. You'll remember me as someone who followed reason. You know, you'll respect me. You don't respect me now, but you ought to respect me. People will think I was too cheap to get you out. Well, it doesn't matter what people think. They would think, they'll think whatever they want to think. And, it's, and if they want to demonize you, they will. They'll find a reason. Your friends are willing to, to, to risk getting in trouble. Yeah, but Socrates says, we'll all be perceived as irresponsible hypocritical lawbreakers, that we have no respect for the rule of law. And I do respect the rule of law. And Crito says, there are other places you can go. No, they're not. <laughs> there aren't. You're playing into the hands of the enemy. Well, that'll be true anyway. And that's where political discourse is so toxic. Um, so when we talk about being an informed citizen. I, that really has to be carefully uh, thought about how to be informed. You're betraying your children. OK, this is a real big problem, right? Um, and it always is for parents. How much do you take risks and worry about public life? And how much do you just ignore that and, and raise your kid? Um, now, you don't have to write this essay. This is from a, uh, the way I ran, used to run the class. Um, what would you do if you were convicted of a crime unjustly? Which of the arguments is convincing to you? So I will ask you that first thing during class. All right. The next class, the next part of the class is Aristotle's virtues. So Aristotle thinks these virtues are natural and they're tied to the human condition. So everybody wants to flourish. They want to use all their natural capacities. 
and to develop themselves as a person and to help other people. Okay. So we are a creature whose destiny is to understand these patterns in the universe, patterns in human affairs, and in the human psyche, okay? So these are Aristotle's um, conclusions about what the patterns are. Each pattern is connected to some aspect of life that's a universal and um, it's what we're born with. We get conditioned and our conditioning is powerful, but hopefully you can see that there's something even deeper than that, that, that is conditioning us. And that really deep, those deep drives where every baby is born with. And then they're born into a social situation. Um, all right. It, okay, there's uh, two extremes. There's too much, too little, and then actually exercising this virtue in a way that promotes your flourishing and other people's flourishing. So one thing is pleasure, right? Drive. And so hunger, thirst, and um, reproduction, sex, sexual drive. Those are very, very basic. And I don't have any problem telling college students that because they know that. Um, but then there's too much, too little, and the me. Um, people disagree about what's too much, too little, or the mean, <laughs> especially when it comes, well, on drinking, let's do that. Some people think I only drink at part, uh, on holidays, that's the mean. Some people are teetotalers, right? No drinking. Some are, well, I only drink on holidays. The other ones, well, I only drink on weekends. Well, the other one, I only drink at night. And well, the other one, I only have like a beer before philosophy class and it makes a lot more sense. <laughs> but in spite of all that variation, you can actually look at data about which countries in the world um, are prohibit alcohol and which ones are pretty indifferent. I remember being in France and watching sixth graders have a glass of beer with their lunch. So, so as far as, as at least that's what it looked like to a third grader, maybe they were eighth graders or something, I don't know, but anyway. So in um, Europe, parents are conditioned. I mean, the expectation is that they would drink with their children in moderation. So their children would just learn to drink in moderation, not a big deal. And then um, the countries where there's college students do the most binge drinking are America and uh, Saudi Arabia. And so there are these countries where it's absolutely prohibited are the parts of the country in America where it's completely prohibited, those are the kids that come to college and just go whole hog the other way. And that's what the Aristotelian model is finding the middle ground. It's not too much or too little. Now, Germany is very accepting. What you want to figure out is that physiologically, 7% of any population is prone to alcoholism because of genetics. Well, everybody affects at least three other people pretty profoundly. So that means 28% of the population is deeply affected by alcoholism, which is why I don't drink. I don't drink because other people are susceptible because it hurts. It's not good for the public public well-being. But I don't judge people who drink. My children drink in moderation. I don't care. Um, but I do want you to think about it. Then the other very basic drive is courage. And that's the virtue in relation to fear. Because fear is a very powerful driver of human affairs because human beings are aware that they are vulnerable, okay? 
and they want to fight back, right? So a politician can definitely punch the fear button pretty easily. And right now, I'm telling you, they really are. They hire professional marketers who study how to appeal to pleasure and fear in order to get people to buy your product. <laughs> and so, yes, the political realm is driven by fantasies and phobias. And it's very hard to be informed without going bananas. Anyway, so there's lots of things that we have to find the, the mean for. The fear of pain, death, fear of failure, fear of failure to succeed in the economic realm, right? To have a career and it's stable. Fear of loss of status, reputation, right? What would they say Fear of social ostracism, you know, being ignored, ostracized. Well, how does fear affect our daily lives? It, it affects it a lot. First of all, our, the fear of death is causing a lot of, I would say, excessive healthcare costs. Because people at toward the end of their life, now it's the last two years, you can spend a whole lot of money keeping people alive for those last six months or two years. And the bills are not getting paid. It just goes all goes into the deficit and grandchildren pick up the bill, right? So there's there was somebody suggested an 80-80-80 rule for the government to fund. Uh, a procedure. So maybe you're over 80 years old and you have 80 days to live. And what was the other criteria? Oh, it costs over $80,000, I think. <laughs> and I'm just that the government wouldn't fund that. I was like, of course not. <laughs> I wouldn't want something that cost over $80,000 to keep me alive in the next two to three months because I don't want to give my children and grandchildren that kind of a bill. <laughs> I just, anyway, it, it shocks me. But the fear of death is definitely driving up our healthcare costs. The fear of pain is also because People want all sorts of therapies so that they don't experience pain. Also, they don't uh, do exercise because they don't like the, you know, it's not pleasant. Um, and the other, there's a corruption of pleasures, right? With eating, we eat sugar. We're all caught up in this basic addiction of serotonin, dopamine, um, ups and downs. It's very unhealthy for your body. It's very distracting for your mind because you're on, you eat and get high and then you gradually feel hungry when you really, your body isn't hungry. Anyway, so that's also a big problem. Um, and so the pleasure and then the pain of trying to do exercise, that's those compound with each other. Um, and then the fear of not getting a job or a good job, that drives people a lot. And it should drive them into trying to do their best at school, which is fine. But um, it can also drive them um, into trying to blame someone if they don't get the job they want or lots of other um, problems. Um, okay. And the fear of not thriving in the economic system or the fear of losing status can cause people to uh, ignore, to break laws or to ignore it when their boss or their company breaks laws and um, all sorts of dysfunction, social dysfunction. So your personal issues and your personal opinions uh, affect social well-being. 
All right, generosity, giving away money for the well being of others. This is philanthropy, is magnanimity, but, um, or time. College students usually give time rather than money because they usually don't have any money. But just that general thing where you depend on other people. So you ought to acknowledge that by donating your time or your money to just granting that, yeah, it's true. I depend on you and I'll take, that's why everyone should be middle class. So that they have a little time to get informed and they have some money to give to the, the organizations they think are doing really good work because that's part of what makes you human. Um, Okay, then really rich people can give money away to promote the society's well-being. This is Bill Gates um, is trying to, to stop climate change. And he started a whole organization with 12 billionaires to get the research and development. And he's really worried about this because it's not working <laughs> because there's another set of billionaires that get rich off of fossil fuel. And they are, um, excuse me, they are um, running political campaigns. So right now, there's just big a big fight among the billionaires. Um, even temperedness is the mean in relation to anger, and you intuitively you can understand that that so that you can get too angry or not angry enough. And then if you don't get angry when you should, you tend to hold a grudge. <laughs> and if you get too angry, uh, you know, you destroy all your relationships, you break down social order. But some people don't get angry at the time, but then, or they, or they overreact by taking revenge. So I guess either type can take overreact and take revenge. And that always causes a lot of problems. <coughs> Rational ambition is most, the students at Lyon have this, I think. They've developed their talents. They know what their talents, what they like. They've stayed in school, they're ambitious. They want to develop themselves to uh, use your natural ability um, and contribute to society as a whole. Um, rational pride is knowing how to honor citizens that make the most meaningful contributions. And um, so this, you have an honor day. Every organization has an honor day. And these are people who go above and beyond what they needed to do in order to create a higher quality of life in their company, in their community, whatever. Rational humor is you take serious things seriously, but you can laugh about yourself. Um, you can, there's so many times when you're thinking about saving the world or whatever, and you can't even get your shoe tied, you know? I mean, life gets in the way. And so we have to figure out how to keep our priorities straight but also laugh when something just silly happens to sidetrack us, right? Um, without getting cynical, right? Because if you just, some kinds of comedians, there's different kinds and some of them just feed our resentments. They just sort of legitimize our, and we mock out other people and that's really unhealthy. And then other ones um, get too trivial. You know, they, they get so focused on the trivial that they're not really educating you. But there's some comedians that really do educate people because they expose people's thoughtlessness, for one thing. There was a comedian in South Africa who won the Peace Prize because his comedy skits would just show people how blind they were. Like women at the beauty parlor who have African-American women working on their hair, just 
gossiping about, well, you can't get any good help these days. And, you know, those African-Americans just don't do what you, or Africans, don't do what you tell them. I mean, and when, when the white women look at that, they can see that, gal, I mean, that's, that's not right. You know, I wouldn't want to be treated that way. Suddenly, you realize you're in a human situation. Uh, rational friendship bonding with people and the desire to exercise one of the virtues to inspire each other so some of your friends are you study with them but some of them you just admire their character and you like being with them because they strengthen your character and um, in college lots of times you make your best friends because now you you can choose them at a level you couldn't before you're exposed to a lot of different kinds of friends and then you get some leisure time, you live with them and you engage in a lot of different activities with them. Because once you graduate, you get married, have a family, have a career, everything gets very compartmentalized. You don't have as much time to meet different people and then to do different sorts of activities with them. Sociability is that you, you know, you put up with minor injustices and there's lots of them that happen. Um, so you just, and now that's happening a lot, microaggressions or whatever it is, um, uh, you just have to learn to get over it. And then at a certain point, some people just decide to speak out, but people all the time are, especially since COVID, they're scared, they're unstable and they'll say things that aren't appropriate. Um, truthfulness, knowing yourself. Don't underestimate or overestimate your talents and do what you can. Now the political virtues, we will get into those next uh, in the next section of the class. We just have a day or two on the personal ones. And then there's that intellectual, there's the ability to create stuff and to do it well. So you would go to a technical school or a, um, you know, shipbuilding, uh, those kind of engineering, whatever. Um, and then if you create products that really develop humanity versus creating products that people don't need, <laughs> um, health food versus candy, um, good shoes that are good for your feet versus those crazy high heels that'll twist your ankle and, and push your toes into pointed, pointed toes and wreck your feet, um, stuff like that. It makes money to sell that stuff, but it's unnatural and it undermines human well-being. Then there's the intellectual virtues, math, science. You're, you're a detached observer. And this is where Colin, you know, uh, thrives, is, is his focus. Um, whereas, so you can picture it. I mean, um, Alyssa talked about trying to link humanities and the sciences and the social sciences. And I think the rest of you, I, I, I can't remember it exactly. Well, law, law is gonna combine facts and values and the legal system and applications. Philosophy is a very good pre-law um, major. Okay, so um, human affairs are less precise than natural affairs because people have this capacity for choice and they'll make some really stupid choices. Um, all right, so this is the long assignment, the 25-pager for you to read about Aristotle's virtues. And then this is a longer list of the virtues and we don't have to get into that. Um, and this one, oh, Socrates and Jesus. So I'm having you read Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, uh, 13 pages. But um, all, one of the things I want to emphasize first is page three, the Beatitudes. Because the issue there 
is that in this kind of wisdom training, Socrates appears to be the one who doesn't believe in this in the gods. Actually, he's the one that can read what Homer was trying to teach. Euthyphro appears to be following what Homer said. Actually, he's just using it to do what he wants to do, or Melitus especially, right? Um, so the people who appear to be virtuous, who the city honors as virtuous, really are not. <laughs> and the person who the city demonized is really the person who was the good guy. <laughs> you end up killing the good guys. So that's what Jesus was trying to get people to, to look with their mind, not with their eyeballs. Again, this is a difference between science and humanities, but especially uh, religion and philosophy, ancient philosophy. You want to turn around and see the world in a different point of view. Um, you are the salt. Okay, here's another issue that I guess uh, I don't know if I have time to bring it up, but the Old Testament has a set of laws, the Torah. And the rabbis were spent many years studying the Torah, and they were the ones that told the people what to do, like the issue of the day, well, how do the laws, how does the Torah apply to it? That's just like Euthyphro, right? The issue of the day, his father's, uh, his, the slave's death, well, how do I apply Homer to this? And um, Jesus said, you know, at the end of the day, you're too legalistic, like you're using the laws. The poor women were trying to gather wheat on the Sabbath on Saturday because they were hungry. And the rabbis said, you're working on the Sabbath. You know, that's terrible. And, you know, these are these people are rotten. And Jesus said, now, wait a second. He said, the Sabbath was made for man not man for the Sabbath. So we have a day of rest to reflect and think about our lives, but we're not slaves to the law, right? It was made for our well-being. Um, yeah, and so you're not supposed to even get angry, right? And uh, before you, you're not supposed to go to church unless you, you stop being angry with it, at anybody. Don't commit adultery. Don't get divorced. How many people in churches are divorced uh, for reasons other than infidelity, right? And you're not supposed to marry a woman who is divorced um, because it's uh, you're committing adultery. Well, how many Americans really believe that? So when you know when people start quoting the Bible. I think you should be careful. <laughs> um, an eye for an eye, it says, do not uh, fight back. Well, but capital punishment, right? Many people use this to say, uh, Jesus did not want capital punishment. Now there's scholars and there's all sorts of qualifications, but um, it's pretty hard to get around that. Love your enemies. Do Americans have a reputation for loving their enemies? Um, Anyway, give to the needy. So, um, so you can read through that. And then my point here is to compare Jesus's virtues with Socrates' virtues. Um, they both stood up to authority. Uh, they questioned. Okay, so they both were self-controlled, but Jesus changed water to wine at a wedding. So he drank in moderation. Um, they both were abstinent or monogamous. Socrates was married, had some kids. So there's no sexual infidelity there. Um, they both stood up to authority figures and exposed their hypocrisy. Um, Socrates did it for people in every sector of society. Uh, there's a lot of Platonic dialogues. Jesus did it to the religious authorities specifically. 
They were the mega church leaders and the Pharisees. So is, what do we do today? I mean, what sort of religion do we have? Do we respect our religious uh, leaders who question the mega church leaders or who question the fundamentalists? Or do we just assume these socially respected religious leaders are the mega church leaders and the fundamentalists? And if that's true, like, wait a sec, what happened? We are, we've tied our religion into our political desire for power, right? Empire building. Um, both of them allowed themselves to be killed. They forgave their murderers. They thought they didn't know better, but people resent them, right? So everybody needs to think about their delusions, their self-deception, and their um, desire to blame somebody else or resent somebody else. They're both innovators. They had a different idea of God. They're both generous. They didn't take revenge. They basically don't get angry very much. Jesus got angry once because the synagogue was being made into a marketplace. <laughs> Now we have these mega churches with Starbucks and all sorts of stuff. What would Jesus think of that? Oh my God. Anyway, both knew that what they did was honorable, even they, although they were killed for it. Uh, both worked as hard as they could to try to get people to re-examine their lives. So Jesus was just a carpenter's son, but he 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 thought he deserved to condemn those with privilege. Socrates was a stone cutter, but he thought he had legitimately could criticize those in power. Both called out people for blaming other people and not looking at their own flaws. Both had friends or disciples who loved them, spent a lot of time with them, but both of them died not knowing for sure if anybody understood their way of life. Um, so that's, again, that's the way I learned it. Um, uh, other people think, oh, Jesus knew the whole shebang beforehand, but that would take the whole tragedy out of it, I think. I think um, it's important to say, well, do I understand it? That's the main thing. Um, do I understand what Jesus was getting at? Uh, both of them got along with people as much as they could. They didn't try to create conflict. They both tried to bring about spiritual renewal to inspire people to focus on living for something beyond themselves. They were both humble. Um, they knew their capacity for making the wrong choice. Um, and in their political lives, they both got caught up in political issues those they offended used the legal systems to take them to court, to take revenge, and to manipulate the masses into voting for them to die. Um, in both cases, the original system was okay. Pontius Pilate didn't want to kill Jesus, but you know, the Jews, he was, Jesus was a Jew, and the Jew wanted him to be killed, so we went along with it. Um, but this, it wasn't the system that was the problem. It was the people using the system. Uh, Socrates liked the system. It was the Athenians who abused it. Um, Jesus was the most pious and was killed for being impious. Socrates the most pious, but he was killed for being impious. Um, the Romans were separated from Jewish law. Jesus says at one point, render to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God. He did not want religion to get politicized. And so, you know, he wanted to split reason and faith. And so I'm sure our founders referred to that quote a lot. Um, let's see, the Athenians let citizens believe anything they wanted until they felt threatened and then they used the system um, claiming, you know, that there's one and only one worldview and that is not the way it was set up. 
The criminal justice system was corrupted. The punishments were excessive. Um, the way the laws were applied in specific cases, particularly Jesus' case and Socrates' case. If Socrates is the greatest gift to democracy, and Jesus and Socrates have the same basic virtues, can we say that Jesus' way of life is, or could be, also a great gift to democracy? What did our founding fathers think? Well, they were religious innovators. They were deists. Uh, they had a different idea of God to fit in with enlightenment science. They were marginalized in England, but they set up the society, the US, where there was no official state religion. And they were called raving atheists for that reason, because never before had there not been official state religion. Um, some of them were Unitarians like Jefferson, who didn't believe Jesus was a Messiah. Um, they, they unified reason and faith. It does not mean they unified church and state, but in their way of understanding faith, they united it with reason, with science, as did Socrates. Um, they were college educated. They, had, they knew Greek and Roman stuff. 85 of them were Church of England, um, but they set up a society that tolerated immigrants whose beliefs were anti-intellectual, okay? Um, why are the patterns so similar? And the reason I think is because the virtues arise from the human condition. We can recognize these patterns. We can tell the story of a person that links their lives to those patterns. And the process by which the mind makes a transition from historical events to patterns is called mythologizing. So the word myth means story. It doesn't mean it's false. It means it's a story. Um, for the Greeks, a myth is more profound because it can teach you stuff. So for example, if somebody says the Jesus story, well, it's partly historical and it's partly mythologized. That doesn't mean it's false. That just means people picked certain stories about Jesus or they even made up stories about the kind of, of person Jesus was. So for example, the story of Mary and Martha, that's a big one for me because my name is Martha. My dad was a preacher, so I know that story. Well, Jesus was visiting them. He, they, he treated women like spiritual equals. They weren't disciples because single women could not roam around with single men <laughs> around the countryside to, you know, talk about God. They would be stoned. I mean, this was totally unacceptable. So he, but there were stories that he treated women as spiritually equal. And so the story of Mary and Martha, Mar Mary was in the living room talking about spiritual things and Martha was in the kitchen fixing the dinner and she got mad at Mary. But Jesus said, Mary has chosen the better part. So the, the story says, Jesus doesn't want women just performing traditional roles. He wants them in the living room talking about the most serious things. Is that the way that the institution of the Christian church has evolved over time? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, I, I was raised that way. I had religious guilt if I did not pursue philosophy. But no, I don't know if I've ever had a student who had religious guilt for that. <laughs> but usually their, you know, their religious guilt would tell them, you know, you shouldn't aim too high, shouldn't be too ambitious or whatever. Um, anyway, so that is the pre-video uh, for now, I have read four posts and I will check to see if some more of them are in. A number of them hadn't come in yet. And it's going to be very hard for you to keep up. The first paper is due tomorrow. Um, 
you know, it can be late at night. I don't care. But it's due tomorrow and things just have to keep moving here. So I look forward to having a good discussion. Again, a safe space for people to come and open up their minds and just get out of ruts and try to find that common denominator where we're all human and we have empathy. We should be able to understand each other, both our capacity for good and our capacity for evil. Like everybody should follow the golden rule, but you see a tragedy about someone taking revenge and doing something really nasty. And then you, but you look at the play and you go, wow, I have empathy. Like I could understand if I were in that situation, I can see myself doing the same thing. And all of a sudden you realize we're all in this together. And we all, especially you and your generation, we could all create a better world moving forward, or we could all really destroy things. And every generation has to pick up the torch, the light of reason, and do what they can to prevent things from getting worse. Okay, I'll see you later. I do not mind if you didn't have time. I did this late. I don't know why I had a weekend to do it. So I'm really sorry. My bad if you don't have time to see it before class. We might, if enough students didn't have time, I might have you watch and then we'll start the class a little later. Okay, take care.